Hello, my name is Joy and welcome again to our five minute devotions. I don't know about you, but I love teleseries. Well, not all of them, but uh, I like, you know, some. I know that some of you love Filipino teleseries and K-dramas, but one of my favorite uh, soap operas um, was uh, a Japanese one entitled Boys Over Flowers. I don't know. I can watch that forever. I don't know why. But did you know that all those teleseries are nothing, absolutely nothing compared to the one I'm going to talk about now? And that is the life story of Rachel. It has all the elements of a very good teleserie. Conniving, adultery, um, suguran, Okay, let me tell you the story in a nutshell because um, Rachel's life story covered a lot of chapters in the Old Testament. Okay, are you ready? One afternoon, a young traveler called Jacob was there. He chatted to the shepherds, telling them who he was and asking about other members of his family. The man pointed towards a woman in the distance, telling Jacob was Rachel, the daughter of his mother's brother, Laban. When Jacob saw Rachel at close quarters, he was instantly smitten. Rachel ran to her father's house and told him about Jacob. Her father, Laban, ran out to meet Jacob, welcoming him warmly. Jacob stayed with Rachel's family for a month, and during this time, he fell deeply in love with Rachel. Rachel approached Laban for permission to marry Rachel. Laban agreed that his daughter might marry Jacob, but stipulated that as a bride price, Jacob must work for him for seven years. Jacob agreed, and he and Rachel settled down to see out the long period of waiting. But neither of them realized that Laban had agreed to let his daughter marry Jacob, but not specified which daughter it could be. Rachel had an older sister, Leah, not so beautiful, but the older sister in the family was usually married before her younger sister. So, seven years passed, and Jacob demanded his bride. When the morning dawned, Jacob realized his mistake. The bride in his bed was not Rachel, but Leah. He had been tricked into marrying the wrong sister. Jacob insisted that they keep to an arrangement. He and Rachel would marry after the traditional week that Jacob must spend as Leah's bridegroom and walk for another seven years to pay the bride price for her. Though she and Jacob were deeply in love, she did not conceive for many, many years. Leah, on the other hand, had no problem in bearing children. She bore Reuben, Simon, Levi, and Judah. Each time she had another son, she prayed that Jacob would finally love her as he loved Rachel. He never did. Rachel faced a different problem. No matter how she prayed to God, no matter how much she was loved by God, Rachel did not conceive. In desperation, she gave her maid Billah to Jacob so that he could conceive a child with Billah as a surrogate mother for Rachel. Billah had a son whom Rachel named Dan, then she had a second son, and Rachel called him Naphtali. In response, Leah gave her own maid Zilpah to Jacob, and this resulted in yet more sons, Gad and Asher. Reuben took the mandrakes to his mother, and when Rachel saw them, she asked Leah if she could have some of them. Leah agreed on condition that Rachel commanded Jacob to have the time with Leah that night. Rachel complied, and this resulted in a fifth son for Leah. She called him Issachar. Later, another son arrived for Leah, called Zibelon. Only then, at the end of this long wait, did Rachel finally became pregnant. She bore a son called Joseph. It seems that Rachel was still angry at her father for what he had done for her. Before they set out, she took the small idols that represented the protective gods of her father's family, telling no one what she was doing. Laban did a search to find a teraphim. He entered the tents of everybody. Then he went into Rachel's tent, where the teraphim were hidden, she greeted her father respectfully and explained demurely that she could not get up because she was menstruating. So, she was a liar too! When Laban was gone, Rachel's family moved on, and by the time it reaches its destination, Rachel was pregnant again. On the way to Ephrath, she went into labor, but this time, things did not go well for her. Pains were very bad, and Rachel suffered terribly. To comfort her, the midwife told her it would be a boy, and it was Benjamin. But Rachel did not live to see him grow. She died in childbirth. Rachel had said once that she would die if she had no sons. In the end, it was having sons that killed her. Did you get the story? <laughs> okay, so what can we learn from Rachel's life? I'm sure after listening to that story, you probably went, wow, grabbing naman si Rachel, right? So I think maybe you're asking, why is she even in the Bible? Maybe because we can relate with her, right? She's very imperfect. We are imperfect. So let's see, let's look at her traits. Number one, jealousy and envy. She was very jealous. She was very envious of what's happening with Leah, right? So the same way with us. We tend to be jealous. We tend to be envious of other people. You know, in social media, we kind of scroll and then we look at the pictures and we look at the captions and we tend to be like, wow, ganda naman niya. Or wow, namamasyal sila palagi. Or oh naman, ang yaman naman. And things like that. So we 
you know, like, like Rachel, we tend to be jealous. We entertain these thoughts that are not really healthy for our mental being and spiritual condition, right? King Solomon reminds us of Ecclesiastes 4.4, 4, and I saw that all toil and all achievements spring from one person's envy of another. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. And one of my favorite Proverbs is from Proverbs 14.30, a heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. <laughs> Pasensya na kayo, ang daming aso rito. <laughs> Number two, Rachel is known to be so beautiful. That's why Jacob fell in love with her. But this, this story of Rachel shows that, in, you know, outer beauty is not enough. What matters is inner beauty, right? Are you kind? Are you generous? Do you care for other people? Or is your world just revolve, revolving around you? So, yeah. So, this is one thing that, we, you know, we can remind ourselves our house, our house, our house, our inner life, house, our inner beauty. Are we working on cultivating that? Instead of investing too much on outer beauty, we can invest more on our inner beauty, work on, working on it so that we can bless others. In this world filled with negative messages about us, we must be vigilant and prayerful so that we can remind ourselves about our inner beauty and self worth. 1 Peter 3, 3 to 4 reminds us, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. Wow, what a wonderful reminder for us. Number three, impatience, right? She was praying for a child for so long, but she was very impatient. She didn't wait for God to answer her prayers. She went on and got her handmaid um, to bear children for her. And she, was, she didn't trust that God will answer her prayer, although she still kept on praying. Pero meron siyang ready na solution. And how many of us are like that? Like, I'm like that. Like, I would pray, Lord, this and that. And then I would have like a plan B, a plan C, whatever, dito sa gilid. Making sure just in case, you know, meron tayong palaging plan B. So that, I think, is one uh, good reminder for us to keep trusting the Lord. Wait on, wait on His answer and just be patient because His answer and His time are always perfect. A beautiful verse reminds us from the Bible, Isaiah 40, 31. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. When we wait on God, it helps us focus on the purpose and direction of our life according to His will. So, important talaga to take time to be still before God so that we can fall deeply more in love with him so that we can confidently know his will as we live out our daily lives. The next is contentment issues. Are we content with our lives? We are in a constant state of discontentment, diba? Right? We're not happy with our leaders, with our spouse, with our children, or the things that we have. Our house is too small. Our, you know, our TV is not the latest model or our smartphone doesn't have the latest 5G technology and all that. Many of us are trying to fill a void of some kind in our lives. And unfortunately, we try to fill that void with things that could never satisfy us, right? Philippians 4, 11 to 13 reminds us, not that I speak from want, but I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Number five. This one is positive. Despite the imperfections of Rachel, the Lord heard her prayers. There was redemption. And I think that's one good reminder for us. The Lord will redeem you always. When you ask for his help, he will redeem you. 
Living in this fallen world as Christians means we will experience trials and tribulations and will continue to struggle with our own temptations. We are forgiven, but God is not finished with us yet. And when we cry out to him, ask for his help, he will redeem us. Acts 3.19 says, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. The times of refreshing may come from the Lord. And in Lamentations 3, 57 to 58, it says, You came near when I called you, and you said, Do not fear. You, Lord, took up my case. You redeemed my life.